Okay, we now begin our eight-minute rebuttals. Dr. Craig, anytime you're ready. Timer begin when he starts speaking. I am really excited about that last statement that <laughs> Dr. Rosenberg made. Honestly, um, Dr. Rosenberg, if you were to read the work of people like Alvin Plantinga, uh, Peter Van Inwagen, um, and, and others on this problem of evil, you would know that hardly anyone today defends the logical version of the problem of evil because the atheist simply hasn't been able to shoulder the burden of proof required to put it through. Listen to what Paul Draper, who is an agnostic philosopher here in the department at Purdue says. He says, logical arguments from evil are a dying, parentheses, dead breed. For all we know, even an omnipotent and omniscient being might be forced to allow evil for the sake of obtaining some important good. Our knowledge of goods and evils and the logical relations they have to each other is much too limited to prove that this could not be the case. In particular, the atheist assumes that if God is all-powerful, he can create just any world that he wants. And that's not necessarily true. If God wills to create free creatures, then he can't guarantee they'll always do what is right. It's logically impossible to make someone freely do something. So God's being all-powerful doesn't mean he can do the logically impossible. So the atheist would have to prove there's a world of free creatures which God could create, which has as much good as this world, but without as much evil. How could he possibly prove that? That's pure speculation. What about the other premise, that if God is all good, then he would create a world without evil? Well, the problem here is that we are assuming that God's purpose is just to make us happy in this life. But on the Christian view, that's false. The purpose of life is not worldly happiness as such, but rather the knowledge of God. And there may be many evils that occur in this lifetime that are utterly pointless with respect to producing worldly happiness, but they may not be pointless with respect to producing a knowledge of God and salvation and eternal life. It's, possibly, it's possible that only in a world that is suffused with natural and moral evil that the optimal number of people would come to know God freely, find salvation and eternal life. So the atheist would have to prove that there's another possible world that has this much knowledge of God and his salvation in it, but which is produced with less evils. How could he possibly prove that? It's pure conjecture. It's impossible to prove those things. And that's why the logical version of the problem of evil has been widely abandoned. Peter Van Inwagen, professor of philosophy at Notre Dame, says it used to be held that evil was incompatible with the existence of God that no possible world contained both God and evil. So far as I am able to tell, this thesis is no longer defended. So Dr. Rosenberg, I, I want to invite you to think about becoming a theist tonight, because the main obstacle that you've presented is, need not be an obstacle for you anymore. Now, what about the positive arguments that I offered for God's existence? The first one was why anything at all exists, and there's been no response in tonight's debate to this first argument. You can't just say the universe exists without an explanation if it's contingent. If it's contingent, as Dr. Rosenberg says in his book, there could have been nothing. So why is there something rather than nothing? The theist has an explanation, but the atheist by his own admission has no explanation. What about the problem of the origin of the universe? I showed that it's no avail to appeal to quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics, things don't come into being from non-being, from nothing. They come out of the energy in the vacuum. But for the universe to come into being, it would have to come from literally nothing, because the beginning of the universe is the beginning of all matter and energy and space and time. Again, theism has an explanation for how the universe came into being, but atheism is impotent in this regard. The applicability of mathematics. All Dr. Rosenberg could say is there are various alternative mathematics like non-Euclidean geometries. That doesn't go one inch toward explaining why our physical universe is structured on this incredibly complex mathematical structure and foundation. Again, the theist has an easy explanation. God constructed the universe on this mathematical structure. The naturalist is at a loss to explain it. 
What about the fine-tuning of the universe? I explained the disastrous results that would ensue if the universe were not fine-tuned, and I also explained why you can't dismiss this problem by the multiverse hypothesis, and there's been no response to that. Intentional states of consciousness. Dr. Rosenberg says, how can one chunk of matter be about another one? I agree with him on this. It can't. That leads him to deny that we ever think about anything. It leads me, rather, to say, but I do think about things. Therefore, there must be minds. And minds fit nicely into a theistic worldview because God is the ultimate mind. And so the presence of finite minds in this world is nothing mysterious. It fits into a theistic world in a way that it doesn't fit into an atheistic world. As for objective moral values, it's the same situation. Dr. Rosenberg rightly understands that if atheism is true, if metaphysical naturalism is true, there are no objective moral values and duties. He and I actually agree on a great deal. But what I would say is obviously it is wrong to do certain things, and therefore it follows that there must be a foundation for moral values beyond the physical world in God, a transcendent personal being. The resurrection of Jesus, again, you can't discuss this responsibly without getting your fingers dirty and looking at those documents. You can't attack other documents like Joseph Smith or Muhammad and use those to impugn the credibility of the gospel sources. The fact is that the majority of New Testament historians who have investigated these documents have concluded to those three facts that I mentioned. Remember, N.T. Wright says there is firmly established as the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, but the naturalist has no explanation. Finally, God can be personally known and experienced. Why can't God be a properly basic belief for me, grounded in my experience of God? I, I don't see why not. Finally, what about metaphysical naturalism? How is this relevant in tonight's debate? He says, these bizarre consequences that he affirms don't follow from atheism, they follow from scientism. But my argument was that scientism or epistemological naturalism doesn't imply metaphysical naturalism. Remember the case of W.V.O. Quine. But if God does not exist, then I think metaphysical naturalism is true. Metaphysical naturalism doesn't follow from epistemological naturalism, but it does follow from atheism. The most plausible form of atheism is, I think, metaphysical naturalism. But there are all those absurd consequences that result from that that I described. He bites the bullet and affirms these bizarre consequences. Why not step back and say, no, this is crazy. This is not the world we live in. Ours must be a theistic world. If his only obstacle is the logical problem of evil, then uh, that obstacle has now been removed. And Dr. Rosenberg should find himself free to embrace joyfully uh, the existence of God as the answer to these deep questions.